The survival of thousands depends on this one working ship. They have to deliver. The cargo vessel Avatak faces the most dangerous conditions in the world. If something bad happens, you're, you're alone. You, you pray. You pray a lot. Her mission? To deliver desperately needed supplies to the near Arctic. The margin of safety is very small. Avatak maintains a lifeline, carrying life's necessities to the north. This is my new car. It's my first purchase of my life for me and my children. Avatak is a tough, hard-working vessel that delivers goods to Canada's near Arctic, places that are unreachable for most of the year. And every summer, the pressure is on her to complete that mission. 113 meters long, Avatak has two cargo holds in her hull, one set on top of the other. Between the holds and her deck, she can carry up to 5,500 tons of cargo, ranging from vehicles to containers to construction and mining equipment. People in the far north depend on Avatak and her crew to bring them all their supplies, but she can only reach them during the short summer season. So right now, she is readying for her first voyage in eight months in the port of Valleyfield, Quebec, near Montreal. From Valleyfield, she will journey 3,500 kilometers to a remote settlement south of Angava Bay. Population 2,500, Kujuwak is the largest Inuit town in the region of Nunavik, Quebec. There are no roads connecting Kujuwak to the outside world. And that's why Avatak's mission is so critical. Well, the Avatar carries on board uh, uh, heavy equipment, machinery, and uh, oversized building materials that uh, normally can't go by aircraft. And we don't have rail here, so it's a vital link to the northern communities to get our goods only in the short shipping season. Back south in Valleyfield, Avatak is gearing up after a winter of inactivity. Loading a broad range of goods her remote customers are waiting for. Langis Lizotte is the ship's captain. This is his first voyage as the mission commander. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. It is a strong ship uh, for the all and all that stuff. It's made very strong. I'm very curious about uh, what this season uh, has for us, all the small surprise. 4,200 tons of various sized cargo is sitting on the pier. The key is to save space all the time, all the time you save space. That's yari, boys. Huh? Jonathan Haché is Avatak's loadmaster. His job is to maximize the ship's 12,000 cubic meter hold. He's got to find a way to fit all this cargo into the ship. Like the propane and the acid and the extinguisher, get some fuel. And a lot of it is dangerous stuff. This is a dangerous good too. Oh, this is jet fuel. It's hard to believe this will all find its way into one compact cargo ship. He works with dock supervisor Alexandre Morset to get the cargo aboard. Because we try to top everything vertically to save some space and horizontally as well. And that's, uh, that's what we do, we try to maximize the, the loading of the ship. No computer program can do what Jonathan and Alex do. Filling Avatak's holes, keeping them balanced and safe is an art. And they have just five days to do it. 
some things are on paper, some are in my head, and then I sleep and I think about all of that. Then I'm like, okay, one done, let's go. We go home. <laughs> Loading the ship correctly can be a matter of life or death. An imbalanced load could lead to a quick capsizing. In icy waters far from rescue, the chances of survival would be slim. Jonathan keeps a close watch. So far, the load is going exactly as he envisioned. The guys are working, we've got two teams, the two cranes are running. It's very, very good for us. I'm very happy for that. It's going very fast. But then, very fast grinds to a dead stop. It's a leak, some oil. Even a small oil leak is a big problem. For Avatac's crew, who are about to be all alone in the far north, mechanical failure is not an option. So we have to go uh, have a look. We have, we get some uh, divers here. And they're gonna go see what's going on. They're gonna have a look. A dive team is called in to investigate. Yeah, so it's a Kirby Borgen Superlight 17, this one. Video camera, light, communications, where you're... Uh, Josh Bazaar is the diver. Safety valve, so there's definitely so five, six hot spots that we, uh, we look for. This is a setback Avatac's schedule cannot afford. She can only reach her remote northern destination in the short summer window and has three runs scheduled. Each takes three weeks to complete. If she's late on this one, it's a domino effect for the rest of the season. But rookie captain Lizotte is relieved the leak was discovered before the voyage started. It is better for that kind of stuff to happen uh, at the dock than uh, somewhere in the north. So we'll get uh, all that fixed and uh, all ready for the season. Three years ago, Avatac suffered engine failure in the remote Hudson Strait. Her crew survived on minimal supplies waiting for rescue. But it took three months to bring her home. This time, the crew isn't taking any chances. Janely Raymond is Avatac's chief mate. Yeah, it's very hard. If something bad happens, you're you're alone. You you pray, you pray a lot. Underwater temperature should be around the 10 degrees Celsius. While Josh seeks to find the source of the problem, the load in has to stop. A shifting hull could kill him. But the waiting around has loadmaster Jonathan on edge. This ship we load it in five days usually, but now we lose a day, so it's not good, you know. Yes, I'm concerned because uh, you know those communities they need the stuff and uh, need to go, you know. Everyone hopes the oil leak problem is small. Hey Josh, you want to show our captain here? Uh, what's going on? Because if it's big. Thousands of people in the remote Canadian North will not get the shipments they so desperately need. The crew of Avatac is under pressure to load their cargo. 2,500 people are waiting for vital supplies 3,500 kilometers away in the far North. But right now, loading is stopped dead. An oil leak has the crew worried that Avatac will not be leaving her home port near Montreal anytime soon. Igor Kondratiev is the chief engineer. Well, yesterday, uh, dead guys, they noticed a uh, little droplets of oil in the water. Can you go on doctor or say on the... Uh... We need to determine where the leak coming from, how severe that is. Yeah, all around there, see if it... Igor hopes the problem is a simple fix. Worst case, if it's a if it's an internal seal in a shaft, then we're talking about dry dock. Avatac would need to be taken out of the water for servicing. Permission would be over, and thousands in the north would not get the supplies they've waited for all winter long. Start rolling in. 
The load was expected to take five days and they've already lost one. After two hours of searching, the dive team thinks they have found the source of the leak. Okay, Chief, we've located your leak there if you want to come and have a look. It's Avitac's variable pitch propeller. The blade's angle, or pitch, can be controlled from the bridge to increase and reduce thrust. High pressure hydraulic oil controls the pitch. Can you back up a bit there, Josh? Of course. The steel washers, which surround the stainless steel bolts on the propeller hub, are corroded. Eric Gauvreau is in charge of the repair. All steel with uh, stainless steel has a chemical reaction, which deteriorates the steel washers. So it's leaving a bit of a gap, and that's where, I'm, uh, where the oil seems to be seeping out. The team decides not to replace the washers, but to remove them altogether. They're more trouble than they are worth. Ben, je te dirais, ta, ta seule approche que tu as là présentement, c'est d'enlever les bolts d'une à une, changer le washer, torquer ça. Captain Lizotte gets word from Avitac's owners. Even with diver Josh Bazar at work, it's okay for the crew to start loading again. For Josh, it's slow, grueling work. Anything that could be simple gets a lot more uh, complicated once you're in or underwater. You have to remind yourself that you got water current, you got only two hands. With the leak being fixed and the loading underway again, the captain is happy. He's eager to get to sea. Well, uh, in fact, uh, yes, I will be uh, really happy when we'll depart from here, when everything will be uh, set. We'll just go and, uh, to be honest, uh, I really like when the ship is going at sea. We are quiet, we are on the way. Navigation officer Christian saint Arnaud makes sure everything goes in, according to loadmaster Jonathan Haché's careful plan. Down here is a very fast-paced environment. Uh, there's a lot of activity. Forklifts are going around really, uh, they turn really quickly. A lot of cargo coming in, a lot of, uh, a lot of equipment. You have to keep your hand on, head on the swivel, keep it safe, and uh, look out for yourself. Dynamite for mining operations. Prefabricated houses, snowmobiles, ATVs, pickup trucks. The differing sizes and shapes of everything make loading Avatac a unique challenge. Dangerous cargo such as dynamite gets special treatment. So when the dangerous cargo comes on board, I take note of it here, then I, I take note of it to, for its exact position. These rough notes must translate to a perfect weight balance. Once the ship is alone in the north, there's no margin for error. Yes, it's uh, getting tight, and, uh, and the hole is getting uh, small. By morning, the propeller problem is fixed. But Avatak is now two days behind schedule. Green's OK. Sounds good. It's all done. Avatak's good to go. And the load-in continues. We just want to make sure that uh, everything will go in the twin deck because after we close the hatch, it's, uh, when we start putting the containers, it's too late, you know? So uh, we want to make sure that everything is in good order. Jonathan's still working out the perfect distribution that only he can see in his mind. Because the plan always changes, right? One of the most cumbersome objects heading for Kujuak is a 12 and a half ton rock drill. The drill is in two separate parts, the compressor and the actual drill. And move everything in the, in the right position, as close to the wall as possible. The drill goes in exactly according to Jonathan's master plan. The cargo hold is fully loaded around it. The main hatches are closed, but they're still not done. Now the top outside deck is stacked with containers. On top of the containers, they put cars, fuel tanks, fishing boats, large optics that don't fit inside the holds. 
Last aboard are the ship's own tractor forklifts, barges, and even small tugboats. Avatac does not just bring the cargo, she brings all the equipment needed to unload it. She transports her own port facilities because Kujuak has nothing but an empty beach without even a single dock. As the last tugboat is latched into place, Avatac is finally ready to go. She is already two days behind schedule. And now, reports of the busiest iceberg season in five years point to dangers and delays ahead. The cargo vessel Avatac is now ready to make her way on a 3,500 kilometer lifeline mission to the near Arctic town of Kujuak, Quebec. But first, Avatac has to turn 180 degrees in a strong current with engines that haven't been run in eight months. And she has a brand new captain, Langy Lisant, in command. Ben, on va commencer à dédoubler dans ce cas-là. On va prendre un peu d'avance. Avatac is a 25-year-old ship, and even the local pilots know she has her own particular quirks. The Avatac is a special ship. With little wind, she just drifts quite a bit, so you have to be very careful and go slow. Otherwise, you'd be in trouble. She has no bar thruster, and she breaks to the left. Very difficult. Yeah, we're all ready to start main engine. Engines that haven't been run all winter roar to life. The local pilots guide her out of the channel. It's two ahead. At 11 p.m., Avatac finally leaves port. She's now swung around and heads east, her week-long voyage finally underway. After days of delay, Captain Lizotte is happy to finally be on the move. Quite happy. Quite happy to leave the dock, to be honest. <laughs> it's always uh, loading the ship here in Valleyfield. It's always a little bit crazy. Things happening, cargo change all the time, and then uh, we run fast for the departure. Something happened, delay. We'll be more quiet at sea. Midship. They crawl upriver through a series of locks, the St. Lawrence Seaway. This links the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. There's a final stop for cargo at Contrecoeur, Quebec. More explosives. So we're gonna take one container at a time and inspect them uh, outside everywhere uh, with a fire truck near that container. And we'll be standby with the fire hose. Clanking sounds from the container set Loadmaster Jonathan Ache on edge. Well, <laughs> yes, everybody's concerned, you know. The container is lifted, but it's off balance, and there's enough TNT aboard to blow Avatac to smithereens. Guys, what we're gonna do? We'll descend. We'll attach this seat there with him. He'll 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 count it. Okay. Hello. Hello. That container of explosive was not balanced. And it was in the middle of two more two containers, so we had some difficulties to uh, to align the, the pins. Parce for uh, space. Locked onto the pins, the container is secure. Avatac passes by Quebec City, the last major port she'll see on her voyage. If she runs into trouble in the ice, the Coast Guard icebreakers based here are her only hope of returning safely to port. Even on patrol, they could be almost a week away from rescuing the ship. On the bridge, Captain Lizotte is already on the lookout for growlers, small icebergs, that look like white caps but can tear into a ship's hull. Small and dangerous uh, piece of ice 
cannot really be picked up by the radar, so it's basically uh, visual. In perfect weather with no obstacles in sight, it's hard to imagine what the ice choked, dangerous seas ahead have in store. On deck, 19 year old cadet Sebastian Boucher checks the ballast tanks that keep the ship level. We need to check all the ballast tanks every day because it's important for the, uh, the officer upstairs to uh, the stability of the ship. He checks water levels in the tanks with a tape measure to make sure they aren't losing any ballast to leaks. 12 meter and 57 centimeter of water. Sebastian is looking forward to his first chance at the ship's helm. Tonight I'm gonna do some wheel and uh, that's gonna be my first time, I'm very excited. I'm not nervous at all because the crew is very, uh, is very cool. I'm excited because that's more part of my future job. Two days out and life settles into a routine. On the ship's stern, Chief Engineer Igor Kondratiev stays in shape with a makeshift gym. Yeah, that's all flanges. That piece, that's the top of the fuel pump. I do a few reps what I can and then drop the weight off and do a few more. And one more. I call it reverse push-ups. Where's your workout? Your ice cream cone. <laughs> My workout is in the uh, engine room. See, uh, the Now Sebastian gets his chance at the helm. Unbeknownst to him, he's also about to be initiated. Go to 065. 065. Example. Am I going down? No. Did you look at your uh, what you were asking? Tell him what to do. It's a how much red are you giving in right now? You must be doing something wrong. Yes, but what? <laughs> Sebastian appears not to know how to control the ship. Navigation officer Christian Saint Arnaud is trying to keep a straight face. The ship is actually on autopilot. Okay, try it again. The ship don't react. What am I doing wrong? Tell me. Okay. Wheelman Marc Bichon wants to see how long it takes Sebastian to figure it out. I don't know. That's why I'm asking. You want me to take over, Christian? Yes. yes. Put a one six nine. Uh, changing wheels, man. Okay. Uh, hole sixty nine. Hole sixty nine for. Hole sixty five. Hole sixty five. Yes. After more than ten minutes of confusion, Sebastian finally figures it out. Hole sixty five. Ah. <laughs> when Mark took the wheel, and I realized that uh, it was an automatic pilot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm okay with that. I found this, I found this funny, and uh, I'm, I play, I'm playing the game. Yes, I'm a cadet, and that's. Uh, <laughs> I need to pass this, uh, those tests. <laughs> it's all laughs now, but come tomorrow, the fun is over as Avatac hits the icy open seas. The cargo ship Avatac is en route to deliver 4,200 tons of goods to the near Arctic. It's the second day of a 3,500 kilometer trip. She's expected to dock in the northern Canadian port of Kujuak in five days. She leaves the St. Lawrence River and now enters the Labrador Sea. This part of the voyage is the most dangerous. Summer is iceberg season and reports of more icebergs than usual put her crew on high alert. They don't get far before facing dangerous growlers, small icebergs made of old, especially hard ice. On the surface, growlers look like whitecaps, but below water level, any one of them can weigh up to 100 tons and can tear through the ship's hull. Yes, Mitch. Chief Mate Jeanelie Raymond is in command on the bridge. 
Guar are very tricky because we don't see them in the in the radar, and they are bear size and they are old eyes. So this is art like a rock, so they can be very very problematic. The first trip, uh, end of June, uh, beginning of July, is very the worst because all the peace is um, is leaving the Arctic and it's going down more south. So the, the, at the time of the year is the worst. Avatak is not an icebreaker. Her hull cannot cut through ice, nor withstand a direct hit from an iceberg. And this old ship is not the easiest to maneuver. Avatak has only a single variable pitch propeller to change speed and a rudder to change course. So we have to go very slow, approach carefully. Four days of treacherous sailing pass as they work their way through the Labrador Sea. After more than 2,500 kilometers of cautious navigation, they are now in Angava Bay and the ice becomes an even bigger threat. Navigation officer Bruno Saint-Pierre has control on the bridge when the first full-sized iceberg appears. Selon la carte des glaces qu'on a reçu, la carte des icebergs était supposée avoir au-dessus d'une centaine de icebergs, mais jusqu'à date, j'en vois juste trois. Uh, I see one big iceberg uh, just on the port side on my route in uh, 12 miles. Si on a l'iceberg, nous on est ici. Captain Langis Lizotte is relieved that there are far fewer icebergs than reported. Let's say that I am very happy that the ice condition is not uh, as the chart said, and uh, for one time at least, it's much better. But the threat of growlers is still out there. Uh, you can't expect many growlers a little bit everywhere. When there is big pace, you can be sure there's small one around. The wind picks up and the growlers are lost among the white caps. Avatak travels only 11 kilometers in four and a half hours. Today alone, the ship's schedule is set back 10 hours. It's a tuna steak, and there's going to be a pasta with chorizo uh, sausage. In the galley, chef Mike Descheng is no stranger to risk. This is uh, for tomorrow, bavette de boeuf. He left a criminal life back in Montreal for the legal thrills of the northern seas. That was in Montreal, smuggling and dealing and with hanging with bad people and stuff like that. And uh, when I got that job, I changed my, uh, I changed my friend, changed everything. I got a girlfriend now and it's kind of hard, but you know, everyone's work, we get to work and I think I do my job pretty well. Another day passes. On the bridge, Captain Lizotte's strategy is to find ice thin enough for his ship to cut through. Instead, he finds growlers hard as rock. Old ice, we have to be very careful with that. With occasionally some area of worse conditions, so well, it uh, doesn't sound very good. We will see uh, how bad it is, and uh, after that, uh, we might call for the assistance on a, of an icebreaker. The next morning, speed is reduced to just two knots, or four kilometers per hour. They could walk faster. Oui, aujourd'hui, à matin, on est obligé de changer de course souvent pour les éviter. C'est trop petit pour les détecter au radar, mais assez gros. Pour faire des gros dommages au navire. The only way ahead is to find the weakest ice. You just put the bow against the ice slowly and then give a little bit of the engine to go forward and the ice will clear up uh, slowly and 
you just go through. We can touch the ice as long as we do it slowly. Lizotte decides to go for it without any icebreaker to help them. But it's going to be a slow trek through the ice. And he'll have to stay on the bridge every minute. OK, uh, je vais prendre uh, l'affaire thaïlandais, là, avec tout ce qui va avec, mais juste une petite assiette. Tu vas monter ça en haut? OK, je te remercie. Conditions go from bad to worse as fog sets in. It's around two knots. I try to uh, keep uh, two knots, three knots maximum. The ETA estimated time of uh, arrival, we change that probably. Uh, not 10 times, but uh, probably close to that. Another slow, treacherous night of zigging and zagging. And they are now two days behind schedule. Finally, they get through the ice and reach the mouth of the Coxoac River. Midship. And there, they face another major challenge to beat the tide and get Avatak upriver to offload her cargo. After almost 3,500 kilometers, the cargo ship Avatak is one day out from her destination, the village of Kujuak. The people there have waited eight months, all winter, for desperately needed supplies. To get there, Avatak has to navigate up a narrow, rocky river. 190. 190. Captain Langis Lizotte is feeling the pressure on his first mission in command. Uh, the uh, entrance uh, and the transit into the uh, Kuchrak River, it's a tricky spot. It's a real challenge, you know, for uh, everyone that uh, has to go there. At low tide, the river is a rocky nightmare. That's a challenge for the ship, challenge for the tug operator also after that. It's, uh, the margin of safety is very small. Kujuak is 48 kilometers upriver. The water level here rises and lowers as much as 10 meters with the massive tide. Entering the river must be timed perfectly. The bridge is cleared of non-essential crew, so the captain can focus. La vitesse? 12.5. Okay. Winds are blowing at 22 knots, 41 kilometers per hour, pushing Avatak from side to side. Déjà, c'est limite un peu avec le vent. S'il ferait 25 nœuds et plus, ça chanterait pas. Captain Lisant has two choices. Enter the river, or lose another day waiting for the next high tide. But once he starts, there's no turning back. Lizotte cannot simply steer straight into the channel. The strong current and high winds would carry Avatak off course, pushing her towards shallow water and shore. Markers on land indicate the center of the river. Lizotte's strategy is to steer Avatak on a series of extreme headings that will work with the wind and the current to keep her on course. Ça, juste pour être clair, Marc, quand on va passer euh, le narrow, je vais probablement te donner des angles de bord. OK? Ça se peut que je les donne tellement vite que tu ne puisses pas suivre, mais c'est pas important. Moi, tout ce que je veux, c'est l'effet là-dedans. Helmsman Marc Bachon must respond immediately to keep the ship in the middle of the narrow river. À droite 15. Droite 15. À bord à zéro. Bord à zéro. À gauche 10. Gauche 10. Lizotte keeps a close eye on the channel markers, keeping his ship online. All right, Carl. Okay, merci. J'attends juste que les alignements soient en ligne. He moves her in the wind and current and expertly keeps Avatak in the center of the channel. That's a fun. A gauche, right? A gauche, right? So, when I say that we're going to do it, we're going to do it. 
On a juste à regarder de chaque bord puis euh, à se tenir dans le milieu, quasiment. À droite 5. Droite 5. Profondeur. Ici, j'ai 7.2 mètres de, de marée. After two hours, the captain gets his big ship safely up the river. He orders the anchor dropped in triumph. Okay, on avant, let go. Uh, three shots. They stop 17 kilometers from town, the only place they can safely anchor at low tide. Now, the monumental task of offloading the ship's 4,200 tons of cargo begins. We are now uh, loading our gear on the, on the barge, the first uh, barge of cargo. The village has no actual port facilities, so the first cargo offloaded is the material it takes to build a temporary one. three hours. Two tugs, two 40-ton barges, and three forklift dozers along with three containers that will be the shore office. The tug takes the barges and trailers to the beach. As they set up the shore station, it's time to start lifting the cargo off the ship. This is the day loadmaster Jonathan Ache has awaited for two weeks. Yeah, there's a lot of currents and uh... Guys have to be very careful. Two cranes work in tandem, loading up the barges. Once the barges are at capacity, they're towed by tugs 17 kilometers upriver. Each load takes an hour and a half to reach the town, and they can only go when the tide is high. Kujuwak is very tough on the tug, boys. The tug operators work 18 hours a day, resting only during the six hours when the tide is lowest. They try to sleep uh, their six hours, and uh, that's it. They, they get back to work. Uh, Kujuwak is the test for the, for the crew and for the tugs. You get a lot of cargo. Each round trip, leaving Avatak, offloading on shore, and returning to the ship, takes a grueling five and a half hours. As the cargo arrives, the local residents are summoned to pick up their goods. I need your signature there. Okay. So See you in a minute. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Cadet Sebastian Boucher gets his first chance at the tug's helm. I'm excited about it because it's a very particular way to unload. Uh, today it's a little bit raining. There's a little bit of wind, but it's, uh, it's still safe. Oh, we don't have the choice. Uh, it's the job. As the delivery unfolds, Jonathan watches his crew carefully. And with pride. I can assure you that the uh, average uh, person are not able to do it uh, without stress, you know. It's, those guys are very good, very proud, proud of them. On one tug, Etienne Dion Lizotte navigates the treacherous river, which at high tide is 11 meters deep. At low tide, barely a meter in spots. Yeah, here in the Kutsuak River, there's a that's a challenge. Suddenly, Etienne gets strange readings. The engine's main batteries are draining. My battery, 8 volt. I used to have 13.5, so she's very low. If he loses power, both the tug and barge he's pulling will be swept downriver by the five-knot current. He's lucky. I made the beach barely. Almost lost the engine. The tug makes it to shore, but it dies on the beach and can't be restarted. So the tug is dead. We, we don't know what is the problem. We tried to fix it, but we got no solution. We're gonna keep trying to fix it before the tide so we can get out from here and uh, go back to the ship. The crew needs to act quickly. They have less than an hour to ride the tide back to the ship. They improvise, 
and use their massive forklift loader to pick the tug out of the water and load it onto a barge. They tie it down and haul it back to the ship for repair. Jonathan has to cope with this unprecedented setback. He's got only one tug working. It's 2 a.m. We're going to resolve the problem and uh, we start back tomorrow. Still a little bit uh, anxious, but uh, we'll find the problem. <laughs> After delay upon delay, Avatac now faces yet another obstacle. Having to offload her critical cargo at half the planned speed, on a treacherous river with just one working tug. A tug from the cargo ship Avatac has broken down on its first day at work in the remote settlement Kujuak near the Arctic Circle. That means Avatac is at half her working capacity, offloading cargo. Overnight, the crew scrambles to fix the tug. Maybe the alternator, because the battery has been changed in the main. The problem is with the alternator. Fortunately, Avatac carries spare parts for just about any emergency. Chief Engineer Igor Kondratiev and his team race to replace the alternator overnight. And by the morning tide, the tug is ready to return to work. I'm happy that uh, it was a small uh, problem and it, uh, it's over now, so uh, two barge again. Now the cargo comes off Avatac quickly and efficiently. And it's up to the locals to come and collect the goods they've waited for for so long. Hi, I'm Mark from Nias. Yeah, Mark. Uh, Robin for uh, Kudrak Pizzaria. Yes, your containers on the beach. Yeah. Robin Dupont owns Kujuak's most popular restaurant. C'est vraiment apprécié que ce soit arrivé uh, aujourd'hui. Every what I have on the menu is very, uh, very good. The people appreciate uh, very, very much my, my food. My poutine, uh, incredible. People like it uh, so much. And, uh, Everything is in the gravy. <laughs> Robin's been waiting for his shipment since winter. Coup, j'ai 22 000 livres de de produits. Fait que pour le coup, ça me coûte moins cher de commander euh, avec le bateau que par avion. Bon, maintenant, hey, ça fait longtemps que j'attendais après ça. Everything is fine. Nothing broken. My plate, fry machine, everything's good. I'm very happy, very, very happy. Road builder Luc Cormier gets his much needed heavy equipment and his dynamite. A drill and dynamite, get a three container of dynamite. If you get no, uh, no ship, you get nothing here. You get no road, you get nothing. Every piece of cargo that Avatac delivers helps keep this remote community vital and functioning. But some items also bring pure joy. Oh <laughs> yeah. This is my new car. It's my first SUV of, it's my first purchase of my life for me and my children. Oh my God! And I'm very proud of it. Living in the Arctic, it's very not easy to get vehicles and it has to arrive in the summertime and we're very fortunate to have this SUV. And I've been waiting for it since February. Avatar is very important because it's the only way for us to have shipping from the south to be shipped to Nunavik. Despite delays and constant challenges, Captain Langis Lizotte can finally say that his first mission on Avatac has been accomplished. Well, yes, I'm sure the people in Kujwak, they are very happy that uh, their stuff is uh, coming in. 
It takes a full week to unload all of the supplies for Kujuak. For Loadmaster Jonathan Ashe, it's a job well done. Yeah, almost done in, uh, for Kujuak, because uh, <laughs> we're doing the last barge right now. I'm sure uh, everyone is quite happy that it is finished here. It was a challenge to do uh, the Kujuak uh, unloading here, and uh, I'm very proud of this crew. Avatak will return to her home port in two weeks and make two more runs north before the long winter sets in. She'll continue her critical role, supporting one of the most remote places in the world. A tough ship on a tough mission, alone in icy seas.